This lecture is going to talk about the famous case of Buckley versus Vallejo, uh, the critical concept of corruption for campaign finance law, and the distinction between contributions and expenditures. And so the concept of corruption and the appearance of corruption are uh, critical to understand because they are the state interest that the Supreme Court has sanctioned for regulating campaign finance. Uh, the difference between expenditures and contributions is critical because, uh, as we'll see in the run-up, say, to Citizens United and the modern campaign finance cases, the court has basically said that ex expenditure restrictions are unconstitutional, uh, but the contribution restrictions can, in some cases, be constitutional. And then finally, we want to talk about the different standards of scrutiny related to expenditure and contribution restrictions. So first, let's talk about corruption. If you don't understand the notion of corruption as it's used in campaign finance law, you're going to be confused uh, in all of these cases. And part of the problem here is that uh, corruption as used in the campaign finance case law is sometimes different than the way we ordinarily talk about corruption. And so there are many different notions that come out of the case law. The first would be just outright bribery. I give money to someone and say, look, I want you to uh, pass this bill, vote yes on this bill, and I'll give you a million dollars, right? That, that's already prohibited by bribery laws. It's not actually um, you know, a campaign finance issue because you're just giving someone uh, money for their own consumption. Similar to bribery, though, is this notion of quid pro quo corruption, which the court has now said is, is really the kind of corruption that it, it means in the post-Citizens United world. And that's a direct official act uh, for money, so that you give money uh, and, and it, to someone's campaign account, and then they would perform uh, an official act uh, that, that you support. But there are other notions of corruption that have come up in the campaign finance case law, even if they've been sort of sidelined in recent years. The idea of undue influence on an office holder's judgment. So it might not be that there's direct uh, uh, money for, for policy that's being purchased, but just the fact that you give money to an office holder might create undue influence on that office holder's judgment. Money also might not buy votes, but it might buy access. This is something that in the case of McConnell versus FEC, uh, the court said was a, a sort of sufficient definition of, of corruption, that money might not buy actual favors, but it might buy you a seat at the table. And so if we think that that is corrupting or potentially problematic for different reasons, then you might restrict the amount of money that people can give because you don't want them to purchase a seat at the table. Finally, there's this notion of the of what we call Austin-style corruption after the uh, famous case of Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce, which we'll deal with um, uh, in talking about Citizens United and the later cases dealing with corporations. And this is specific as uh, as related to corporate influence on the political process. What, what, what Austin-style corruption was, was the corrosive and distorting effects of immense aggregations of wealth that are accumulated with the help of the corporate form and that have little or no correlation to the public support for the corporation's political ideas. So that was a, a kind of distinct notion of corruption than bribery or quid pro quo corruption. It's the corrosive and distorting effects of wealth, uh, from, of corporate wealth on the political process. And that sort of brings us to the kind of larger way that we talk about uh, corruption, which is that in many ways, the notion of corruption is not about a particular transaction, but it's about some distortion of the political system. So sometimes when we talk about corruption of the process, we talk about something like gerrymandering is leading to corruption or, you know, certain types of, of voter restrictions are corrupt. And so it becomes a catch-all phrase for everything that's wrong with the system. And so as we think about this, this term in, in the context of campaign finance, it's really critical to think about how money corrupts office holders. That's the way that the court has thought about um, the notion of corruption in campaign finance, the way that money is traded for votes or for influence over the political process. At the same time that the court has said corruption and fighting corruption is a legitimate and perhaps even compelling state interest when it comes to campaign finance restrictions, this is an interesting area of the law where even the appearance of corruption has been said to be a, a, a legitimate goal for campaign finance reform. Here's the way that, that Buckley versus Vallejo actually puts the matter. It says, of almost equal concern as the danger of actual quid pro quo arrangements is the impact of the appearance of corruption stemming from public awareness of the opportunities for abuse inherent in a regime of large individual financial contributions. 
Congress could legitimately conclude that the avoidance of the appearance of improper influence is also critical if confidence in the system of representative government is not to be eroded to a disastrous extent. Now, given that these are First Amendment cases, these, these campaign finance cases are First Amendment cases, it is sort of unique to uh, consider the idea that appearances of a problem would be enough to justify uh, action to restrict what are acknowledged First Amendment rights. And so I want to just highlight that kind of aberration. We wouldn't think in a, you know, say an incitement context that if you fear communists uh, speaking that they might cause a, a disturbance, that that would be enough. You have to show, uh, right, that there's um, there's an actual risk of violence or of incitement. But the, the notion of this appearance of corruption is in some ways, a way to kind of back up the state's interest in corruption. It's sometimes very difficult, as we'll see, to prove corruption. And it might be a little bit easier to prove that people perceive corruption, and the court has recognized that the appearance of corruption would be a legitimate state interest. Now, in recent years, particularly in Citizens United, the court has um, downplayed this appearance of corruption rationale. In Citizens United itself, it says that the appearance of influence or access will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy. The fact that a corporation or any other speaker is willing to spend money to try to persuade voters presupposes that the people have the ultimate influence over elected officials. This is inconsistent with any suggestion that the electorate will refuse to take part in democratic governance because of additional political speech made by a corporation or any other speaker. And so while the appearance of corruption rationale is still an available state interest, um, even after Citizens United, certainly the, the court has, has expressed some skepticism of that state interest, uh, which was originally established in Buckley versus Vallejo. So what evidence do you need in order to demonstrate corruption or the appearance of corruption? And when I say you, I mean the, the state that's defending a campaign finance law. So the standard is in flux after Citizens United because the court has moved to a more uh, narrow definition of corruption. You see that in, in their um, uh, advocacy for a quid pro quo notion of corruption, but let's just sort of get it on the table as to what in previous cases have been has been the evidence that's been sufficient in order to demonstrate corruption in the appearance of corruption. The case Nixon versus Shrink Missouri government PAC in which the court upheld a $1,000 contribution limit uh, is instructive here. There, the court upheld that contribution limit based on what was pretty meager evidence when it comes to uh, corruption in the appearance of corruption. There was an affidavit from a senator saying that large contributions have the real potential to buy votes. There were newspaper accounts of large contributions supporting inferences of impropriety. You say, well, look, this person received a lot of money and then this person voted a particular way on a bill. Uh, that, that Those newspaper accounts suggested that there might be uh, impropriety. And then there was a large initiative vote in favor of campaign finance restrictions. These were the, the kinds of evidence that the court in those earlier kind of pre-Citizens United cases designated to be sufficient in order to justify campaign finance restrictions to combat corruption. Because the court said, look, it's not crazy, it's not novel or, or implausible to think that large amounts of money, if given to candidates, will lead them to behave in ways that are different they would have behaved than if they didn't get the money. And so the, the amount of evidence that was necessary, the court said in Nixon versus Shrink Missouri government PAC, depends on the novelty and plausibility of the state interest. And here, um, it's, it's certainly plausible to think that large money has the potential to buy votes. So now that you understand corruption, that there, there are many different definitions, but that the court has moved toward this kind of quid pro quo notion of corruption and the kind of evidence that would be needed to prove corruption, Let's talk about the different types of campaign finance restrictions, uh, particularly those that were uh, most salient in Buckley versus Vallejo and later cases, contribution restrictions and expenditure restrictions. So as with the notion of corruption, if you don't understand the difference between a contribution and expenditure, you're going to have a real problem when it comes to campaign finance constitutional law. You got to understand this difference. And so a contribution is when money is given to a candidate or a political party from a particular contributor. And an expenditure is when money is spent by an individual party, interest group, corporation, union, or other group. Now, expenditures can be independent or they can be coordinated. So usually when I talk about expenditures, if I call something an expenditure, which we mean an independent expenditure, meaning that I, as an outsider, or I, as a candidate, are just deciding on my own how that money is going to be spent, and then I spend it in a particular way. 
Because if I talk to the candidate and I say, hey, how would you like me to spend that money? Then that's what's called a coordinated expenditure, which is basically just like a contribution. It's money spent in coordination with the candidate. And it's just like giving the candidate the money uh, yourself. But the notion of independent expenditures, that when you spend money advocating for the election or defeat of candidates, you are doing it independently of the candidate, is absolutely critical to understanding campaign finance law. And it, and it strikes people as somewhat um, inconsistent with their experiences. So you see these super PACs or you see these corporations or, or rich individuals spending money in these huge sums. And you say, well, that's corruption. That's just they're, they're uh, having an effect on the candidate. And for the, for the court and the constitutional law governing campaign finance, there's just a complete difference between spending money independently or taking that same amount of money and giving it to the candidate. And the general rule for contribution and expenditure limits is that contribution limits are going to be subject to something, some form of intermediate scrutiny, which we call Buckley scrutiny, that a contribution must be contribution limit must be closely drawn to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption. Whereas when it comes to expenditure limits, those are going to be subject to strict scrutiny, and they're almost always going to be struck down. That's especially true after Citizens United, where corporate court makes, uh, bans on corporate expenditures are now just viewed as the same way as bans on individual expenditures. And so, uh, as we'll discuss in a moment, expenditure limits are seen as encroaching on core political speech. And so uh, pretty much any limit on expenditures is going to be seen as unconstitutional. The one exception would be restrictions on expenditures made by foreign nationals uh, so that, you know, the Russian government can't spend uh, unlimited amounts of money consistent with U.S. campaign finance laws uh, on American campaigns. But as a general rule, when it comes to uh, domestic spending, that any institution, whether it's a, a corporation, a union, an interest group, or a candidate or contributor, that they have the unfettered First Amendment right to spend as much money as they want on campaigns. So why does the court distinguish between contributions and expenditures in this way? So the first reason is that uh, contributions and expenditures are seen as posing different threats when it comes to corruption. That contributions, because it's literally money changing hands, me giving money to a candidate or party, that's seen as posing a much greater risk of corruption. Whereas independent expenditures, which are not coordinated with the candidate, where the candidate doesn't necessarily um, um, tell me to spend money in a particular way, and money doesn't change hands between the, the person spending the money and the, the candidate, that is seen as um, sort of sufficient absence of coordination that it's not going to lead to quid pro quo, right? In order to have the kind of quid pro quo risk, you have to sort of give the quid in order to get the quo. You have to give the money to the candidate in order to get the political favor that you're asking for. At least that's the sort of legal fiction that governs campaign finance law. So here's the way Buckley versus Vallejo uh, explains the distinction and explains why independent expenditures are different. It says, unlike contributions, such independent expenditures may well provide little assistance to the candidate's campaign and indeed may prove counterproductive. The absence of pre-arrangement, that is, uh, you know, or and coordination, of an expenditure with the candidate or his agent not only undermines the value of the expenditure of the candidate, but also alleviates the danger that expenditures will be given as a quid pro quo for improper commitments from the candidate. Now, of course, I just want to emphasize, this is about independent expenditures. If you ask the candidate, how would you like me to spend this money? That becomes like a contribution. But when it comes to independent expenditures, that absence of coordination and prearrangement is seen as core First Amendment activity, and it doesn't pose the same risk of quid pro quos. And therefore, uh, in the expenditure limitations, because they can't be justified as preventing corruption in the traditional sense, they're seen as infringing on core First Amendment freedom of speech. As Buckley says, a restriction on the amount of money a person or group can spend on political communication during a campaign necessarily reduces the quantity of expression by restricting the number of issues discussed, the depth of exploration, the size of the audience reached. This is because virtually every means of communicating ideas in today's mass society requires the expenditure of money. As the court says there, the concept that government may restrict the speech of some elements of society in order to enhance the relative voice of others is wholly foreign to the First Amendment. The equalization of permissible campaign expenditures might serve not to equalize the opportunities of all candidates, but to handicap a candidate who lacks substantial name recognition or exposure of his views before the start of the campaign. So expenditure limits 
are seen as, as affecting and infringing on core First Amendment activity. What about contribution limits? Well, it's seen as a less direct regulation of speech. Um, if anything, it's limiting speech by proxy. That is that the contribution only affects the candidate's speech by forcing him or her to raise money from more people, right? And so the, the expressive component of the contribution is seen in the mere fact of the contribution, not in the amount, meaning that, th that it, there's not any sort of big difference between the communicative impact of a $1 contribution or a $500 contribution from the standpoint of the contributor, that that you still, with any check that you're cutting to a candidate, you are expressing your support. And so when when the law restricts the amount of money that you can give to a candidate, it's not directly affecting your speech in the same way that it affects the speech uh, through an expenditure limit. And also that, that um, when it comes to infringing on uh, First Amendment rights, when contribution limits infringe on First Amendment rights, a lot of what they might be doing is messing with your associational rights, that um, it would be uh, limiting your freedom to associate with a candidate by trying to uh, give money to it. And, but, but so long as you're able uh, to give money to a candidate, that association between the contributor and the candidate is seen as, as largely protected. So when it comes to distinguishing between contributions and expenditures, the real issue is how much of an infringement on freedom of speech do you think is posed by the particular campaign finance regulation? For the court, expenditure limits are seen as infringing on core political expression. Um, contribution limits, on the other hand, are sort of affecting sort of ancillary uh, rights of uh, freedom of expression. Uh, if anything, they affect sort of speech by proxy, they affect freedom of association, but so long as you're able to contribute um, limits on the amount that you can contribute are seen as consistent with the First Amendment. Here's the way Buckley talks about contribution limits and speech rights. A limit on the amount that any one person or group may contribute to a candidate or political committee entails only a marginal restriction upon the computer's ability to engage in free communication. A contribution serves as a general message of support for the candidate's views, but doesn't communicate the underlying message of the support. The quantity of communication by the con contributor doesn't increase perceptibly with the size of the contribution, since the expression rests solely on the undifferentiated symbolic act of contributing. At most, the size of the contribution provides a rough index of the intensity of the contributor's support for the candidate. A limitation on the amount of money a person may give to a candidate or campaign organization thus involves little direct restraint on his political communication for it permits the symbolic expression of support evidenced by the contribution. And so the idea here, again, is that so long as people can contribute, their freedom of speech is being protected, that they are actually able to um, uh, communicate and symbolically express their support for the candidate. Now contrast this with the way Justice Clarence Thomas uh, dealt with the issue in Colorado Republican Federal Campaign Committee versus the FEC. Because he, like many on the court, believes that there's really no difference between restrictions on expenditures and, and restrictions on contributions. As he says, contributions and expenditures both involve core, core First Amendment expression because they further the discussion of public issues and debate on the qualification of candidates integral to the operation of the system of government established by our Constitution. When an individual donates money to a candidate or to a partisan organization, he enhances the donee's ability to communicate a message and thereby adds to the political debate, just as when that individual communicates the message himself. Indeed, the individual may add more to political discourse by giving rather than spending, if the donee is able to put the funds to more productive use than can the individual. And so the contribution of funds to a candidate or political group thus fosters the free discussion of governmental affairs, just as an expenditure does. Giving and spending in the electoral process also involve basic associational rights under the First Amendment. And so this notion of speech by proxy is for Justice Thomas, you know, critical uh, First Amendment activity. The fact that you can uh, use your contributions to enhance the voice of the candidate is not a reason to think of contributions as lesser political speech, but in fact, on a par with your individual expenditure of funds. So now uh, we've established that, that strict scrutiny applies to expenditure limits because they're core First Amendment activity. But what is Buckley scrutiny for contribution restrictions? So to reiterate, the, the standard is the contribution limits must be closely drawn to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption. But what is meant by closely drawn? Um, Buckley has some hints. Um, you can't sort of drive the voice of the candidate so low through your contribution restriction that it drives the candidate's voice below notice. 
You also have to allow candidates to amass the necessary resources for effective advocacy. So a $1 contribution limit might prevent someone from really being able to run for office and to run an effective campaign. And the Supreme Court's decision in Randall versus Sorrell in, in 2006 provides the, the greatest guidance here, although it was a pretty unique case. But that was a, 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 it was unique because it was the first time the Supreme Court had struck down a contribution limit as unconstitutional. And the court struck down Vermont's contribution limits, which were pretty low. They were $200 to $400 per office and struck it down under uh, Buckley scrutiny. Now, why did it strike those particular limits down? Well, they were the lowest in the nation. And so just to review, corruption uh, is a critical uh, component of campaign finance law. It is the co preventing corruption or the appearance of corruption are the legitimate state interests that the court has identified uh, for restricting campaign finance activity. But that uh, restrictions on expenditures are presumptively going to be unconstitutional as infringing on core First Amendment rights. Contribution restrictions are going to have to pass Buckley scrutiny that they are narrowly drawn to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption. And Randall versus Sorrell tells us that um, narrowly drawn means that it still has to allow for uh, uh, challengers to incumbents to launch uh, effective campaigns.